Welcome to the American Psychiatric Association. We are beyond thrilled to have you all here today, both virtually and in person, for our second mental health roundtable conversation of the 2023 APA More Equity in Mental Health Initiative. Since Congress dedicated the month of July as B.B. Moore Campbell National Minority Mental Health Awareness Month in 2006, the APA established the More Equity in Mental Health Initiative to promote mental health equity for young people of color. This is our roundtable conversation um, and is our last in our list of community activities this month focused on mental health equity. My name is Veronica Hanlinge, and I'm a senior program manager in the Division of Diversity and Health Equity here at the APA. Before we begin this morning, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered is the ancestral home of the Nakoshtank and Piscataway peoples who have served as the stewards of this land. As we pay respects to their elders past and present, please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today and acknowledge that it is our collective responsibility to support and pursue policies and practices that respect this land and its first peoples. So to officially get this morning started, I want to introduce you to our three amazing speakers. Dr. Regina S. James is the Chief of the Division of Diversity and Health Equity and Deputy Medical Director here at the APA. She is a child and adolescent psychiatrist with over 25 years of experience providing leadership and direction in the planning, policy development, and implementation of national and international health disparity programs for children and families. Joining her, is this year's More Equity in Mental Health Initiative Grand Marshal, Mr. Jay Barnett. Jay is a former professional football player turned, family and family, turned marriage and family therapist with over 10 years of experience as a youth mentor, author, and motivational speaker, soon to be called Dr. Barnett. He was recently featured in Men's Health Magazine as one of top 60 influencers who are worth the follow and joins us after completing the Just Heal Bro Tour, an initiative designed to help black men find strength in vulnerability and mental and emotional healing through education and community. Moderating today will be distinguished journalist, speaker, and producer, Ms. Candace Adkins Wilson. She's the news producer for the radio show, The Daily Drum, which airs on WHUR 96.3 FM, Howard University Radio Network. In this role, she has worked with various celebrities, including actress Taraji P. Henson, and covered several conferences and national platforms. So I know we are in good hands today with these three brilliant individuals. So please welcome me in joining our moderator, Ms. Candace Atkins Wilson, to kick off this roundtable conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica, for a wonderful welcome to the American Psychiatric Association. I am pleased and pleased to be here today, both to celebrate and honor the legacy of B.B. Moore Campbell. Let's give us a hand, please. And to raise awareness on mental health disparities facing our young people of color. Today we speak on the critical topic of teen suicide among black youth and importance of supporting mental wellness in communities of color. Addressing mental health challenges among young people of color is a key issue in the U.S. The Surgeon General recently released an advisory on youth mental health citing the, the rise in anxiety, depression, and suicidal ideation among youth. We've seen an alarming rise in suicide rates among black teenagers with suicide now moving up to being the third leading cause of death among this demographic to the second. Yikes. And we know that there are still significant barriers to assessing mental health care and support for young people of color. I'd like to take this time, so let's dive deeper, let's talk about it, and let's begin to find some solution for this critical issue. Let's get to work. 
Let's start with why are we here, Dr. James? Dr. J, can I say Dr. J or Dr. Burnett? <laughs> Dr. J. Dr. J, all right. Can you share a few words? Why are we here and why today's conversation is so important? I'll let my grand marshal start and then I'll follow Well, you. I was taught ladies first. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Well, then I'll go. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, first of all, thank you so much, Candace, for that great introduction and reminding us that this is uh, B.B. Moore Campbell, Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And that's exactly why we're here, to bring more awareness, more education, to share with communities who have been significantly impacted by death by suicide and suicidal ideation and all types of mood disorders uh, disproportionately than the rest of the population. So we want to bring this conversation so that we can normalize talking about mental health and mental wellness and also talk about resources available, things that you can do. And you know what better place to have this conversation is here in Washington, D.C. at the American Psychiatric Association uh, with two fabulous guests. And I think that um, as we have this conversation today, I think we're going to really have a lot of information for the community. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here uh, to share as a grand marshal uh, for the APA uh, and a more equity um, initiative. I think, as Dr. James alluded, uh, you know, BB's uh, mission was really to bring awareness. And I think as you're bringing awareness, it's also uh, not just having dialogue, but also allowing dialogue to really take its course. Because some, so many times I think that we are talking about issues, but we're not really processing the issues in the conversation. What does this look like in real time? What does this look like as a black and brown young teen boy, young teen girl? You know, what are some of the disparities that they're facing? And so I think today, why we're here is not only to shed light, but provide insight and also provide uh, feedback for those that are watching. Because I, I, I work with a lot of parents that, um, that are afraid uh, because uh, this generation, I feel that sadness really looms over their mental. Um, you look at the music, um, you look at the, the social media activity, um, you look at the increase of uh, depression, uh, ADHD, all of these different things that they are challenged with, that we were challenged with. Right? So they're facing and harassed daily with so many different decisions to make before they are an adult. And so that's why we're here. Do you think they're forgotten? They have a space and place. There's so many distractions, so much going on. Parents are working, teachers, mentors. Do you feel that they have a space that they feel forgotten? I'm not sure if they feel forgotten, but I do think as time moves on, there's just a lot of activities and a lot of distractions uh, for our young people in general, and particularly for our young people of color. And so I think that, again, um, having, you know, we're more technologically advanced now, so having the social media platform and how many likes do you get determining sort of, you know, if you're accepted uh, by your peer group, um, you know, that, that's a huge issue. And, you know, the issue around how one looks, uh, looking on social media, what is the perfect look for a young lady or a young man, you know, that is also an influence. What are you eating and your size? And so I think there's a lot of emphasis on the external uh, particularly for our young people coming up. And so we really have to sort of shift that and remind them uh, to really be, you know, comfortable within themselves. And that's where the support system, whether it's your parents, your family, your church members, just your community members, that's why it's so important to have a support system around you to really reinforce who you are and whose you are. Dr. James. Uh, APA has done a great effort to engage the communities of color through the more equity initiative since its inception. What can the community members do to start normalizing the conversation about mental health? I think a couple of things. First is just beginning to have the conversations. Just beginning to have the conversations among each other is a part of really normalizing the conversation in itself, not being afraid to talk about it, not being or feeling like you have to keep your emotions and these issues around mental health and mental wellness in the closet and actually bringing them to the forefront as if you would talk about any other health issue. I don't think you'd have a flag to say I have diabetes, but at the same time, I don't think people are as uncomfortable talking about the fact that they may have a physical 
uh, ailment as much as they would be uncomfortable talking about the fact that they have a mental health uh, issue because they tend, to, people in general tend to associate mental health with more of a weakness and something that you can have control over versus, you know, my body is just going awry and that's why I have like diabetes or cardiovascular disease or heart disease. So I think just really having those conversations and allowing people to know that it's okay to talk about it. And I want to say I do think that, you know, recently with a lot of, you know, professional athletes as our Grand Marshal here who openly talk about things around mental health and other athletes and other entertainers, I think that also helps normalize the conversation because particularly our young people are looking up to them and they're talking about it and they're comfortable with it. So then they become a little bit more comfortable with it as well. So I think just having those conversations. I also think watching the words that we use in our conversations is also important. So not saying things like, you know, uh, you know, he looks mentally retarded or they so crazy or that's a lunatic, you know, using those mental health words in a derogatory negative way really reinforces the shame that's associated with mental illness. So I think we really need to be conscious about the words that we use in these conversations. And lastly, I think just really engaging the community in general, whether it's your religious organization or other community organizations, to really begin to help promote how important it is to talk about mental health and mental illness. So maybe like in your church, having conversations or having a, a workshop around mental health and mental wellness to let them know that the church and you know, mental health professionals are working together to really address the issues that are facing our community. Jay, what have you come across in terms of some of the challenges that young people of color face in assessing mental health support? Uh, one, as a therapist in, in whose practice, and, and, and I began working with adolescents, and I began my work with families, uh, there, there's no connection. I think there's a lack of uh, cultural competency when you look at a lot of these uh, mental health providers. Um, 80%, what is it, 86% of all psychologists are white. Um, you look at less than 2% are black, and then less than 1% are black males. And so there's a, a disconnect there, as Dr. James were, was speaking about. So not only are you not able to have the conversation, you're also not able to have that conversation with someone that is culturally informed that looks like you. And then you have those who may be in this space and that can provide care. There's a lack of cultural competency mm -hmm. uh, and cultural sensitivity. And so uh, I think what is missing that when you're talking with young people and you, you know, we have labeled them as Gen Z's, and when you're speaking to them, I think there, there isn't a bridge that we meet and I think it's been so divided where you have the different generations, whether it's the baby boomers or whether it's the millennials or it's the Gen Xer, and everyone is saying how it was in their day, but we have to respect where, what it is today for them. You know, uh, we didn't grow up with devices, and so most of us played outside. And if playing outside and playing with your neighbor, that probably increased your social skill. These kids lack the social skills because everything is here. You know, I've, my friend had a party. I want to break this up a little bit because I feel like it's a little too technical. <laughs> <laughs> my buddy had a party for his son, seven years old, and it was a roadblock party. 20 kids, like this. Wow, oh, okay. No one was talking. <laughs> Nobody. No, no one was talking. So you look at how they are being uh, developed and how they are being um, you know, rear, there isn't this what we're doing. So when someone does ask how they feel, it's kind of like there's this pushback and this resistance like, I, I don't know how to answer that. And then to go back to Dr. James, um, you know, when she was talking about uh, the words, this is why it's important to have these spaces because until I hear the language, I don't have the words. So I can be misappropriating or misusing something that, to me, I don't see it harm in it. Well, that boy's crazy. But in our world, that can all be triggering. And when you are thinking about kids, black and brown kids, if they're in an environment where there's violence, if they're in an environment where there's a low socioeconomic, um, you know, this, this, this cloud that's over them, 
Um, you got arguing, you got fighting in the household. There's no community within the community. And all of a sudden someone says something and triggers them. And to them, their brain is saying, well, you're better off not being here anyway. Because if you're not here, you don't have to deal with all of this. It would be great to just not wake up. And so I just want to kind of go that direction just to kind of, you know, uh, uh, lay it uh, contextually so there's understanding that most of these kids don't feel that people can meet them where they are. And that's why my approach, uh, I feel, has not only been effective, but it's been received. Because I know what it's like to walk in a space and you walk into an APA, you see people in their suits and you see people, you know, in, in their business attire and you feel, how do I connect with them? Mm. You know, how you see me today is yeah. how I was at my private practice, mm. you know, and the kids, I got J's on and I got this dope edge up and, you know, and I would use those things because they'd be like, yo, Mr. J, man, that's a fresh edge up. <laughs> And yeah. I allow the edge up to guide the session. Mm -hmm. And I would go, man, how I feel when you get a fresh cut? Man, Mr. J, I'll be feeling fly. What does fly feels like for you? Mm -hmm. Man, I just feel like I'm on top of the world. That's the door. And now that's the door that leads me to the conversation of what is it like when you don't feel fly? Mm -hmm. Now I have connection. And once I have connection, I get invited into this space. And that's what we're missing. We're doing a lot of talking, but there's no invitation. And there's no invitation because no one feels like, well, do you really understand what I'm going through? Because think about it. We'll show up in our suits, and the next day you're here, an individual took their life, and we'll go, how? John was so happy. Well, because... We are accustomed to performing. And these kids are growing up in a world where performance gets you attention, right? It gets you likes. You get your reels number up, and you make, make a little money on the side. We're growing up in a society where these kids are making millions of dollars on YouTube. They're seeing money that most people would never see in a lifetime. So their mental health is being attacked daily, not just because of disorder, but it's the environment. So you wake up every day, it's like Dr. James says, well, she looks like that. That's not me. And you have young black girls who are looking at the margin of beauty being moved daily. We're talking about black boys, but no one's talking about black girls attempting more so. Exactly. And no one is speaking about ages 5 through 12 Ages 5 through 12 are two times more likely to die by suicide than their counterparts. What's your advice to approach our black girls and black boys on having conversations? Like, you have a great approach, the way you being yourself, coming in and they feel comfortable with you. But for us that see these young people every day at church or in our communities, what's the best approach how we can speak to them? And before you answer that, I just want to underscore yes. something that he said is very important. Yes. And that's the cultural sensitivity that you display, as you mentioned, in your practice. That is so important. Yes. And I know that is something that we try to teach and try to make people more aware of because it is very important. In order to connect with someone, they have to feel like either they're meeting me at some level, whether it's you know the same language, the same race or ethnicity, the same cultural understanding, like knowing what fade means and edge, you know, all that. That is so important for them to begin to even open up and to begin to have that conversation. So I'm so glad, Dr. J, yeah. that you brought that up because it's so important. Yes. Yeah. But yes, for both of you guys, what's the best approach? I just think, you know, whoever you are authentically, as I, just, uh, I mentor a lot of therapists, and the first thing I tell them is your education is not, gonna, it's not what's going to make you effective as a clinician. It's going to be your ability to step outside of yourself and to step in the space of the client. Because effective therapy is contingent upon the relationship. And so I think just talking to people, you know, it's like, you know, when I can't, I, whenever I go into a room of people that I don't know, and you're, you're talking to somebody who I used to battle with anxiety of just like walking into rooms that I didn't know people. Because, you know, we all thinking like, man, 
Am I, do I look okay? And are they looking at me? Do I got something on my face? And we, we all have those <laughs> thoughts, right? But what I've learned to do is to find something that stands out not only to me, but about that person, right? And, you know, like I've mentored girls for years when I started in mental health. And every girl, right, was really, you know, their appearance was everything. And I would be like, man, that's a cute shirt. Are you, I said, what, what made you put that together? Oh, Mr. J, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my door. And so I think, we, we, I think we're overthinking. And, you know, we just need to get back to just connecting as humans. That's what the best, you know, it, it, uh, that I can advise. It, it, it's, 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 it's not some technical and, and it doesn't have to be overly clinicalized or overly analyzed. It's just connecting to people. And you'd be surprised. I was 31 years old, and I've shared this, when I first went to therapy after football, and it was after my second suicide attempt, which was a failed attempt. The first time in 31 years that somebody ha had ever asked me how I felt, Dr. James. First time? First time. I've been asked how I'm doing, which is relative connected to what? performance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But how I feel it, man, I just broke down in tears. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, I, at 13, my parents divorced and I became the man of the house. And as one of your colleagues was speaking about the adult, uh, adultification and most black boys, you get thrust into this role like you're the man of the house. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, y'all calling me the man of the house. I'm still longing to be a boy. Mm -hmm. And so he asked me how I felt. I sat there in my seat. I said, man, I don't know. And can I tell you, most men that I have and boys that I've asked that question, it's the same response. So, man, how you feel, man? The tears just come because it's like you don't have the language. Mm -hmm. And we're wanting kids to speak to us about what they feel. And most of them don't know what they are feeling. And I think this is why it's important that as we are having these conversations and you're providing resources, is using it as an opportunity to also insert education because showing them an emotional chart that's expansive beyond anger. Most crime is committed because of anger and pain. And if you get to the root of it, it's rejection, yes. it's abandonment, mm -hmm. lack of self-worth, feelings of inadequacy. That's all it is. And so I think, you know, this, I, I love these conversations because I, I, I love to go underneath the drug because I think too many times we stay on the table and we just kind of check off the box. But we got to pierce, as I say, can you... Uh, uh, um, pierce the flesh without rupturing. So can you get in that heart space? Because that's the work that we're doing. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that, Dr. James? I think he did a great job, and I think we need to pierce the rug, so let's go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So let's, let's keep let's going. Go let's yeah. go, so let's go. It's, it's in my understanding that the LBGTQ plus youth of color face a higher risk of mental health. Can you both speak on this and share what steps can be taken to create inclusive, supportive environments for our LGBTQ young people of color? And I think as you mentioned LGBTQ, you know, it's, it's an issue of also just intersectionality, right? You're not just uh, race or ethnicity, but you also identify as LGBTQ. You also identify a particular language. So just, I think the issue is accepting people where they are and being open and embracing and have a listening ear and not being so judgmental. I mean, I think automatically as humans, we have our own biases. You know, we've taken in information, we've sort of, you know, calculated what does that mean and where do we need to go and how do we need to respond. Sometimes that's a good thing because it keeps us out of harm's way, but sometimes it cannot be a good thing if it takes us in a way that makes us more biased or prejudging someone. And I think that's what happens with our LGBTQ youth. I think that what happens with our black and brown youth. 
I think people just have preconceived notions of what does it mean to identify in certain groups and then they start to engage with them accordingly, which I think is unfair and, and very biased. I think uh, having health care providers or mental health professionals who reflect the community and who reflect the society is one you know, key way because if, for example, you have a person who does identify as LGBTQ+, and they see a mental health professional who also identifies in that way, again, there's that connection, mm -hmm. at least some baseline understanding of certain things um, about what that person may or may not have gone through. And just also just being open to listening and understanding where that person is coming from without making judgment. But in terms of sort of the workforce issue, I think it's important that's why it's important to have a diverse workforce in mental health because you have all people come from all different walks of life and they need to be able to connect with you. You need to be able to understand the nuances of who they are, not be judgmental, and really be able to embrace the person as a whole person and not necessarily put sort of judgment um, checks around them. Uh-oh. It's about to go down. <laughs> yes. I'm going to look at the camera on this one. Yeah. I'm going to do like Stephen A. <laughs> right. The camera. right. I, I want to say this. I want to take this a step further. Uh, because we tend to reject what we don't understand. We all do. When we're presented with information, details, data, uh, it's kind of like, eh, I don't know about that. For those that are watching parents, it's, it's not so important that you understand, but it's also important that you're able to collaborate in a sense. What is it that you need? And I think our issue when we talk about this is we're trying to understand their reasoning rather than seeking, what do you need from me? Um, I work with so many kids that were coming out and helping parents understand that even a person who lives freely and how they identify. Coming out is a daily process for them, right? Because even if you are quote unquote living in your truth, it's also the consequence of what it costs you, somebody shaking their head, to live in your truth. But no one talks about that, right? And so again, this going underneath the rug. And part of that is understanding that what they need from me, it's not necessarily just for me to understand, but what they're needing from me is to support where they are. And in understanding supporting where they are, I now become an ally rather than this person because now this is where we have the homophobia. This is where we have all of the, uh, I don't know about that. You know. But when you have a posture where as a human being, what is it that you need from me? that even if I don't understand, I'm still in a posture where I am listening to if I can't help you, I can get you to somebody mm -hmm. who can help you. Mm -hmm. Going back to what you said, this is why having a diverse workforce is so important, to have people from different walks of life that doesn't look like you and I, that they look differently like the world. And then also providing information to where we're not presenting this arcane uh, uh, structure where it's just kind of like, oh, well, you know, I know this, but you don't. No, we all need to know. Because guess what? This, we are all learning and growing in this space. As the community is expanding, as there's different things mm -hmm. that are expanding, we have to remain students. And as I said, when I was in private practice, a client come in, they said, Mr. J, you're the expert. So I said, no, I'm a student. You're the expert. Bring me into your experience. And I've sat with so many people from different walks of life, and I, just lit, and I just listened, and I became a student. And I realized what their concerns, what their fears, what their different challenges were, what their uh, trepidations were based off of what they needed from their families. And then also, lastly, creating a more systemic approach. Stop trying to fix this part, and let's focus on fixing the whole. Like I get a parent come in, my child is gay, can you fix them? No. And I would often say to a parent, I never forget this story, I'll tell a quick story. A parent brings a child in, the child is uh, at this time 
I, I, don't, I don't think they had converted over to, uh, uh, it, it was still called an Asperger's, right? And so, and you know, it's artistic and functional. And the, the mom was like, well, I, I need him to be fixed. I said, he came to you like this. So rather than him changing, you need to change. And I think so many times we're looking to try to change people rather than looking at how can we change the system to embrace them. Because if I fix your child and insert them back to, into this toxic and dysfunctional household, it's just going to, it's a cycle. So whenever I was doing therapy, I said, no, the whole family needs to be here. Because you need to understand not only what this child needs, but you also need to understand the role that you will play in allowing them to feel safe about who they are. So they're not feeling alienated and feeling like I have some disease that you're going to catch. And they feel like, no, I'm a part of this family system as well. And they're not looking at their sexual identity and and their sexual orientation. No, this is my son. This is my daughter. This is my mom. This is my dad. This is my sister. This is my brother. So I think we, we, we have to focus systemically on the whole that as we're changing uh, as a culture and as a society for us to all remain students and continue to learn. Why are we talking about parents? Parents and people that work with young people, what are some signs to pay attention to when, um, when it comes to identifying a person who may be at a higher risk of suicide? And what are the steps that they should take to identify those signs? So let me start by saying, um, I don't know if people present a specific way, you know, before death by suicide occurs. So what I could say um, is, as a parent, just having that relationship with your child and then beginning to notice any difference. So you know the baseline. If, you, if, you're, if you're talking, you're communicating, you kind of know the baseline of where they are, and then begin to watch for differences or any change in the behavior, like did they like to hang out with their friends all the time, and then now they really don't want to hang out with their friends anymore? Uh, did they like to listen to music and go to parties, and they really don't want to do that anymore? Um, were they, you know, just getting like seven, eight hours of sleep, now they're sleeping all day, or they're not sleeping that much at all? Did they pretty much eat most of their dinner every night, but now they really don't have much of an appetite, and it's been going on for a while? Um, so any sort, or, you know, or maybe they're just a little edgy, you know, you say something to them, and they're just a little edgy, a little more aggressive, just a little more, you know, on, on edge, more so than they used to. So I would say any change in behavior is an opportunity to have a conversation asking them how do they feel or what's going on or maybe getting a little deeper. And if you aren't the person, then trying to figure out who do they connect to. I mean, because sometimes it could be their peers. Um, it could be some person at school that they actually connect to, maybe a school psychologist. Uh, it could be, you know, the youth pastor at the church. I mean, but making sure then that you also, you know, another doorway is your primary care physician, like your pediatrician kind of saying when they go for their exam or if you want to make an appointment for them to see them, I kind of notice a change in this. I kind of notice a change in that. And then they may be able to give you some pathways or recommendations in terms of what to do. Do they need to see anyone? Do they need to follow up anywhere? But definitely take the signs seriously. I wouldn't necessarily say just kind of push them aside. But as a parent, I think you have a good feeling if you have communication with your child when things are changing, when things are a little different. And they may think, you know, you're all up in my business and all that kind of stuff. I really, well, I'm getting personal. I'm like, I really don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I, I don't um, because I am all up in their business because it's my business to be in their business. So um, I think it's just important just to maintain that connection and to look for changes in baseline behavior. I think that's sort of the, I would say that would be the key. But Dr. J. What about for, uh, you can, before you start, what about for uh, little boys and little girls in grade school? What, what would be those signs? So I have three nieces, uh, two are 13, one is eight, um, who's on the spectrum. And I have two nephews, five and six. And I'm their only uncle outside of their, my, both of my sisters being married. And so you, you have me and their uncle. And they all know what I do. You know, um, 
they sit and watch my YouTube stuff and they and you ask them, what does your uncle do? He helps people deal with their issues. You know, that's <laughs> their thing. So to them, I'm not a therapist, I'm an uncle. I'm not King J, it's Uncle JJ. What I've noticed on kids in that age range, ask them about their friends. It tells you everything. I sit there and get on the floor, Diggy, tell me about your friend. Oh, I have this friend, Kaylee, she's a nice girl, but sometimes she's me, boom, boom, doorway. And I'm like, what, what do you mean she's mean? Sometime when I want to play with them, they don't play with me. He's a black kid that goes to a predominantly white school. And I was like, wow, he's experiencing racism. Mm -hmm. And he knows it. And because one of the kids said something to him. So the pathway, it's always just through conversation. And I think we have become so isolated because we are a very lonely society. We are, as I like to say, we, we are overly connected, but we're underly commune. Mm -hmm. We don't have community anymore. Mm -hmm. And so when questions are asked, we're so accustomed to being in our box that it stops us in our tracks. And so you now have to process. And what I've started doing is just no matter when I'm with them, I just always, you know, hey, man, what are you watching on TikTok, man? Oh, this guy, this kid, Brian, is playing with toys. Uncle Jay, you know, he makes $30 million a year. You know, I mean, and, and because these things are shaping their pictures, because life is lived through the pictures we create here. This is why therapy is effective, that if you change the pictures, you change the story. So if you keep playing these different pictures, you will see why somebody's life has been what it is, going back to patterns. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, pay attention to the pictures. And if the pictures change, you know, oh, okay, something's not right. J Joe is, he's normally excited about football. How's practice? I was all right, mm -hmm. boom. Coach demoted me because I, so it, it's, it's those little nuances, as Dr. James was saying, and again, I don't like to overthink and overanalyze. It's just, to me, I want to simplify because we are all educated in this space, and the terminology is often just, you know, regular people would be like, cognitive distortions, <laughs> like, oh, what is that? You know? But to, I, I think if we simplify it mm -hmm. to where just we take this... Uh, information that we have is education and simplified and bring it down on their level and I just talk to these kids they just got a dog and I was like so you guys know this dog come with responsibility yeah this is a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got to walk the dog and, and we got to get up and feed them and they tried to leave another day and my me you know, my sister's like no you can't leave them with me you guys ask for them and I saw their body language change. I said, hey, 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 what's, what's, what's happening? I just want to play and not be bothered with the dog. <coughs> and these are teaching moments. Mm -hmm. And I think we're so busy that we miss teaching moments. And not a teaching moment, sit down and let me talk to you. Again, it's conversation. We're going to take this time for Q&A. Those of you who have questions or comments about our discussion, which is pretty good, right? And very informative. We're going to take this time to do the, our Q and A. And if you are watching online, feel free to um, state your questions and comment in the chat. We'll be sure to get to them. Who you're with and your question? Sure. Good morning. My name is Rylinda Rhodes. I am a resident of Ward 8, Washington D.C. I'm also a business owner and a social entrepreneur. I make soap and body butters to, and soap products to. Bring awareness to mental health. I'm Did you bring woman. butters today? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I bought a car, though. Um, I suffer with PTSD, and I am recovering from bipolar depression. I have a high school senior that just graduated from Dunbar, 
who has experienced a lot of trauma due to gun violence. And um, we've had open conversations about her suicidal ideations. So I want to talk about the system of care. She comes from a household of effective communication because I've done tremendous work on myself. So we're, it's a safe space where we can have these conversations where she can come and say, Mom, she texts me in the middle of the night, it's like, I don't want to be here anymore. And we can have these conversations. And I sat her down and we talked about what that looks like because I'm also a certified peer with the Department of Behavioral Health. So I know crisis prevention. I know what these things look like. So we agreed that she needed another level of care because I got her connected to a therapist and things of that sort. And she's like, mom, it's not enough. So the day after my birthday, March the 10th, we walked into Children's Hospital uh, to get her a psychiatric evaluation and we were held hostage like prisoners. It was a horrible experience. We went in there. When we first got there, there were six 250-pound DC police officers with a juvenile black young lady who was experiencing a crisis. And it was horrible how they were handling her. So of course, my daughter was already had dealing with what she's dealing with. And then we see that. And then in that process, they just kept apologizing to us as opposed to helping the child which is a whole nother level. But separate from that, we were in there from Friday until Monday, and you know what that looks like. When you come in and you say that you're experiencing these things, you're put in a space where you're evaluated. And they admitted her Friday evening, but they did not have a bed for her. So literally, we stayed prisoner in this small room. And basically, they're coming in. I'm like, OK, well, you admitted her. She can't get upstairs. They don't have a bed yet. But I need you to give her services while she's sitting here. We're just sitting here. We're sitting here day one, day two, day three. We're not getting any services. So I, as the parent, had to find a bed for her somewhere else. And I was able to get her transferred to Dominion Hospital for where she started her care four days after. But within those first three days, she just kept saying, Mom, I wish I hadn't said anything. I wish I hadn't said anything, because we're sitting there and we're not getting support. Worse than that, the social worker that came in is also her social worker at the high school. They're not providing grief counseling for these children in the schools. The staffs that's in the schools are not trauma-informed. They are re-traumatizing these children that actively come to them. You have a child that's coming to you, and we're not getting help. And the social worker that showed up just walked in. I was like, oh, my favorite student and my daughter, she just broke down. She's like, you've never even spoken to me. I've come. I've tried to get help. You're not even there. And you come in here like you know me. Further, there's no ethics. Because he went back to the school, and he informed the school that she was at the, in the hospital. So now her peers at school know. These are some of the barriers that we deal with. I got her connected to a core service agency. And it's not a system of care. They're not even speaking to one another. There are like seven people on the team, and no one is speaking to one another. So, But when they talk to us, you can tell that they're not speaking to one another. And Ryan, she's 17. She's like, Mom, they don't know what they're doing. It's extremely overwhelming when you go to get help, and it's unorganized. And the persons, people that are delivering the services are not working on themselves. It's adequate in their behavior. Yeah. My daughter's like, am I here to help them? Or are they here to help me? Let's give him a chance to comment. We're going to go to the next question. Want to comment what you said? I, what she's echoing is what I hear often. Um, and, and as I used to tell clinicians, that's what she ended with. Uh, you can only take your client as deep as the work that you've done on yourself internally. And I would echo that to everyone in this room. You may not be a provider, but I think as you work on yourself, people have a better experience with you. And I want to say, Mom, I apologize that you guys are having to experience that because that furthers, perpetuates her thoughts. And this is why, I, and it almost, sounds like the 72-hour hold. Yeah, I, I don't know if you guys read B.B. Moore's book. I'm actually, uh, I'm actually producing. Uh, there's a film that's in the process now, and I'm one of the producers. And as you're speaking, it sounds like 
that what she wrote. And so it's because of the, uh, uh, the lack of care, but it's also the lack of empathy. And I think culture humility is so needed in this space. And when I got into this, and I'll say this, not only was I, I, did I believe that it was divine, but there was this burning desire. And I feel like people have the burning for it, but they don't have the learning. And you need both, a burning desire to help people, but also you need to continue to be growing. Because I could tell you, I experienced the same thing as a, as a pro athlete. You're gonna get tossed around because in the healthcare system, they look at black and brown people as if, oh, you could take this pain. Data. Yeah, and it's data. And so this is why um, research is important from us. I just want to echo that, from us. Mm. You know, because these kids are going to tell us what we need to grow, the areas we need to grow in. And we need to listen more to them without just throwing a bunch of statistics of this is what this peer review article has said, this is what this doctor or PhD, no, what are they saying? And the majority of these kids are dealing with so much and you think whether it's a, uh, a school shooting every time you turn on, it's, I mean, what, over, over 250 mass shootings thus far? And we're not even, you know, <laughs> we did, was it, what, is it six, seven months into the year? That's a lot of pressure. And then you take the violence around, it's just, and, you know, so I, I, I thank you for sharing because I, 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 I hope that everyone hears that yes. it may not be something that you have experienced or understand directly, but hopefully indirectly, you understand how vital your role is in this space, whether as a provider or, 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 um, or someone who helps facilitate, it's important and this is why this initiative is, is so important. Dr. Yeah, I was just going to echo, um, again, thank you for sharing your story. You are vital, and as I was listening to you with all your educational background and your experience in the area, and you really know where to reach out and where to go, and still deal, dealing with a fragmented health care system and, and, and the issues that go along with it, I'm so glad that you shared your story. Um, but at the same time, I hope that we can continue to learn from this and understand the importance of why we need to have a more cohesive health care system, uh, something like a, like, a, you know, like a collaborative care model, for example, where you have the psychiatrist there along with the primary care physician working hand in hand would definitely be something that may have avoided that type of situation. So I just want to say my heart goes out to you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing. My next question. Thank you. First, I want to thank the um, APA for this informative conversation. It is so much needed uh, in our community, so we will know about this issue and where we can get help. I would ask you, Dr. James, can you speak a little to the racial disparities that exist in treatment? Um, we can identify the problem, but we have to be prepared to send our folks to the right treatment resources that are necessary for them to be whole. So as we strive to erase the stigma and we want to find places where we can direct people to, we need to be very clear and open about the racial disparities that exist in treatment and what we can do about it. If you can speak to that, you or Jay. Thank you. Yeah, I, I can start, and I always like to use the scenario of, uh, my husband laughs at me, of the, of the yellow brick road in terms of all the boulders and barriers that are in our way before we actually get to health care. You know, internally it starts with some of our own thoughts and our own ideas about even recognizing do we have an issue, what does the issue look like, is there any shame behind admitting that we have any issue, so there's that kind of boulder or barrier. Then it's healthcare professionals and the biases that they bring. You know, research supports that racial and ethnic concordance between a patient and the provider actually helps with mental health outcome. But as Dr. Jay mentioned, there aren't that many uh, people who look like you in the mental health care arena. There aren't that many mental health care professionals, period, let alone 
uh, in terms of psychiatry, psycho psychologists, and things of that nature. And then if you do happen to get someone who doesn't look like you, there could be that cultural barrier, that language barrier. So there's that boulder of the healthcare professional. Then there's the healthcare system, as was shared by the young lady here, of how disaggregated and disconnected it is. And just really, if, you know, depending upon where you are, are you close to someone? Is there someone around? Is there even a hospital around? Um, does your insurance cover? Do you even have insurance? Um, you know, those types of issues in terms of the mental health care system. And then there's also the social issues, right? And I think that was also mentioned, the, the, the discrimination that impacts you, the racism um, that impacts you, um, you know, poverty, uh, where you're living at. I mean, there's so many barriers to actually getting to appropriate health care and providing health care for individuals, particularly black and brown individuals, that you actually have to get over, um, one can understand why there are disparities. Um, so I think it really is a range of variables that are impacting why we are seeing these disparities, but we cannot forget, and I just wanted to underscore the social factors or the social, some, some call it the social determinants that impact our health. That's a big piece, you know, they call it where we live, learn, work, and play. Those factors truly have a sure. huge impact on accessing care, getting appropriate culturally sensitive care, and things of that nature. One last thing. Um, the DC Health Benefit Exchange Authority, which manages DC Health Link, the online marketplace, the board of directors just passed a policy that all health plans that come through the DC Health Link will only have to charge $5 for therapy. Uh, that's, big, that's huge, that is huge. Because uh, one of the barriers to getting treatment is the cost. We know that any therapeutic session will take 12, 13, 14, 15 sessions, and you can't come in and pay uh, $100, $100 for every session. Right. So the finance, we're, we're working to eliminate some of the barriers, and I commend our board for passing, at least when you go back, it's only $5. And so we can spend that on McDonald's. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but we can spend it on getting the help that we need. So I yeah. commend it. The, the and, 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 and I was just going to add, for those who don't know, she's trying to stay incognito. That's Dr. Yes. Linda Wharton Boyd. <laughs> uh, she has actually uh, <laughs> worked with B.B. Moore Campbell to establish B.B. Moore Campbell Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. So thank, thank you for you. being here and thank you for your work. She was trying to stay in the She's trying to stay in <laughs> And also just wanted to uh, acknowledge that our CEO and medical director, Dr. Saul Levin, is here in support. <laughs> Thank you, Saul, for your support and your continued support. Are we tied on time? Can we still talk? We still have another question up here. Okay. And then we're going to go to some questions from the live stream. Wonderful. Yes. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for this fabulous panel and this very loud mic. Um, my name is Dr. Zaina Bocolo with the Jed Foundation. I lead their policy, advocacy, and government relations work. And at the Jed Foundation, we focus on mental health awareness and suicide prevention, particularly on college campuses. And I really appreciate the conversation about best understanding and serving the generation that we're serving right now. Um, because Jed, for example, has been around for about 24 years. We've been doing implementation on college campuses for over two decades. And what we're finding in serving this particular generation is there has to be a pivot in how we're thinking about the impact of the pandemic. So the pandemic, whether we want to acknowledge it or not, caused a collective trauma response. So those earlier age uh, suicide attempts, five and, and 10, as Dr. Jay mentioned, um, that is exactly what you would experience if you are experiencing a collective trauma, which is, when not just in your household you experience a trauma, where your system, your society has shifted. So I'm wondering around, and my, my, my bias is I've been a clinician for, for about 14 years, trauma-informed, and my heart goes out to parents that are thinking about advocating for their children because we're finally in the conversation where systems are finally being held accountable for how we receive folks when they have mental health challenges and gratefully uh, Dr. Biden and President Biden are now finally having conversations around mental health parity. So I'm hoping that there's additional ways to scale resources. But in the real, <laughs> but in the meantime, as we're working directly with these populations, can you give some insights on how we do two things? 
how we teach our current youth that stress is okay, that for, I think your dog example really stood out to me because that's a good example of whereas when I was growing up, if I had that challenge, that was just something that I would have to kind of shake off, do the responsibility and move on. But because of the trauma impact of the last four years, that can really wipe wipe a youth out. And then also, how do we give them the language that they don't have? So I've, I've experienced within my practice those tears of frustration, that, that, that language translation barrier around what you're going through with, with mental health. How do we best practice ensuring that we're not talking at these 30,000 foot levels around implementation policy parity, and we really don't forget who we're really trying to serve, which is the youth, our, our, our future, essentially. Thank you. Thank you for your work and, and thank you for your advocacy and, and thank you for your contribution to the space, um, and especially from a policy uh, perspective. You, you, when I started, and Dr. James, you know this, black and brown folks, mental health is still new to us. And without the pandemic, no one knew. I was the only black male that graduated in my cohort uh, when I finished grad school and then been a former uh, a football player, I can remember sitting in a class and my peers uh, were, were, were white colleagues and, and of course in their mind, like, why are you here, you know? And it wasn't so much that, you know, that I couldn't be there, but they're looking at the whole NFL thing. And, 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 and then one day I shared my story of the two suicide attempts and how football hid me. And when football was over, that trauma from childhood, that ACE, that, 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 that adverse childhood stuff came back up, right? And so I'm calling it stuff. But I think what is important is what I've just helped develop in Texas, uh, where we'll be implementing um, to 30 high schools for athletes is emotional wellness and development programs where we are helping these athletes understand their emotions beyond anger, their emotions beyond uh, as they experience failing, because this generation don't like failure, right? This is a cancel culture, which I think is very unhealthy because what you are saying is that you're not allowed to grow. You're not allowed to evolve. You messed up, that's it, you're done. You know, and, and I think that's very dangerous. And so uh, from what I am looking to implement, not just in Texas, but hopefully as we're working abroad and, and from uh, uh, a, a bigger, you know, uh, view is to look at how can we implement these programs into the schools to where they are required for these students. Because this generation, they know this tech, they know this phone, but when it comes to their emotional and to their mental wellness, they are at a standstill. I was, I'm, I'm gonna tell my age, I'm an 80s baby, and I'm sure <laughs> some of you, I, I want to kind of, you know, bring some more context. A lot of us grew up not knowing how to express how we feel because we were raised in a generation where children were seen and not heard. So, but we knew how to manage and we didn't know what it was. Some of us are just now learning language. Oh, I was dealing with abandonment from dad because Dad not only had us, but we found out Dad had a whole other family. That's a whole other story. You know what I mean? So, but serious, because because people are, you know, millennials and and baby boomers, like like this is new for everybody, right? So, but we somehow kind of had this level of resiliency that we knew how to manage. Now, here's where I will applaud this generation. They know what they're feeling, meaning like they can tap into it. I'm sad today. I don't feel like going to school, but they lack the ability to manage. So when it hits them, the world falls apart. It's that he broke up with me, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? And so this is the extremes that we are dealing with. And so I think it's important for us to simplify, as you said, come, come down from this 30,000 view and come on their level and provide not just program, but tools and spaces for them to exercise this muscle because it's a muscle that has to be used and has to be worked. And you have to, you know, be given the space to, 
okay, what do you do when you feel like you're falling, up, the world is falling apart? And what I teach my nieces and nephews is that I want you to be so stable that if this world falls apart, you don't fall apart. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Thank you. Questions, Trump? Question from the live stream, and then we're still going to write them down, and we'll answer them after the conversation. Okay, one more question. Okay, one more question. What recommendations does this panel have to help galvanize community members to proactively address this crisis and to get care from black psychiatrists and other providers of color? And for Candace, how can black media help to elevate the importance of treatment? So uh, we're going to go with the first question, what organizations are available? That was the question? That sounds like a thesis. Okay. What, <laughs> I'm sorry. What recommendations do you have? <laughs> What recommendations do you have to help? Recommendations, oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Nonprofits, you can go first, Dr. Sam. So what recommendations do we have to galvanize sort of this? Okay, so, okay, thank you, because <laughs> I couldn't quite hear it all. So, I mean, I could say one, because we're here at the American Psychiatric Association, we do, you can go to psychiatry.org, put in your zip code on our landing page and actually find a psychiatrist uh, near your area. Uh, for black and brown folks, there's also the Black Psychiatrists of America. I think we have a member here uh, in the audience um, who's a part of the Black Psychiatrists of America, and they are actually building a database of black psychiatrists around the U.S. so that you can identify someone of color. Um, there's also the National Alliance for Mentally Ill that also has resources, um, and I will go on to Dr. J to see if there's anything additional that you'd like yes, to Yes, uh, I would say the Boris Henson Foundation, which is Taraji P. Henson Foundation, yeah. they provide free therapy, uh, I think up to five sessions. Also, there's Black Men Heal, and then also uh, there is a uh, page of Black Psychologists Today, I believe, if I'm not mistaking. Uh, they have been very resourceful uh, for those uh, that are on social media often that are you know, looking for resources that may be near. And I think also they have a small database, but not as one um, to where you guys will be working on ex uh, ex expanding that, but to be able to provide resources uh, to those who, who are looking for those services. There was a question for the media. How can the media get involved in mental health? Is that correct? Okay, okay, great. So, it's you. That, that is me. <laughs> okay, I'll go. Yeah. So, one thing about what we, as the, our media organizations, they only focus it on May Mental Health Month, this month, and, and that's it. What we do at WHUR, a very prominent <laughs> black radio station over 50 years. Come on, come on, come on. Come on I am her, <laughs> I am the vice president. I make it my effort Monday and Wednesday, Medical Monday and Wellness Wednesday, mm -hmm. to talk about conversations that is appealing to us not just D.C. area, but overall of what's going on. Medical Monday, I talked about what we talked about, um, postpartum depression and uh, Black Maternal Mental Health Week. Mm. And then Wellness Wednesday is that conversation. We go deeper on toxic relationships in the families. Mm -hmm. So it just mm -hmm. doesn't have to be about oh, suicide and doesn't have to be about our youth. By our youth, I do, I do not forget about our youth. I'm a former teacher. But I top parenting conversations on how our youth and parents can talk more about yes. different issues. So as me organizations, organizations, I just really encourage news directors and producers to pretty, pretty much do something at least once or every two weeks, not once a month, to continue the conversation so our communities can have some awareness and it comes from the media organizations first. Writing, print, and broadcasting. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah, in digital media. Yeah. So <laughs> we have to that's, we that's, have to keep going. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because mental health is life in motion, and I'm so glad Candace said that yes. that it's not just May, it's not just June, Men's uh, Health yeah, Month, it's not June. July. You know what I am advocating for? Uh, I am I've just created a uh, show. Um, which is my show, Healing the Culture with Dr. J, and our first activation is gonna be at Carnegie Hall in New York. And so I'm wanting to be innovative with music, be innovative with media, things that connects to them, so that, again, look at the room. Not everyone is gonna come in these spaces, but if we can use media to be the vehicle 
to say, oh, wow, I just watched this, this, this episode on managing anxiety and then managing anxiety in a way that speaks to that person. And I think that's, that's going to be awesome. And I hope to be the Grand Marshal again because this has been awesome. <laughs> <laughs> right. And you have been yeah. awesome. Yeah, you have been have. awesome. I, I don't advocate. I don't advocate. I, everybody, their mama is like want to partner and want to work. But I want to say thank you to the APA for this awesome opportunity. You guys have been awesome. And this, is, this has been a, a learning experience to learn more about what you guys do. Um, of course, uh, you know, a lot of our articles that comes from the APA when we're in grad school and those things and research. But just to experience everyone here, I want to say thank you for the job that you guys are doing to keep BB's um, legacy alive. But just to really create an opportunity for folks who wouldn't normally sit and have these conversations to listen and sit in on these conversations. So thank you, guys. The social media platforms for APA and, and, and your social media for people to Oh, yeah. Uh, my um, Instagram, Twitter, or X, uh, whatever they, uh, uh, Elon's doing. But all of, it, <laughs> all of it is the same King J. Barnett. And for the American Psychiatric Association, uh, we're on every social media platform. So wherever you go, we are there with you, as well as YouTube. So we have YouTube uh, episodes about various uh, mental illnesses and substance use disorder. Uh, and so yeah, that's wonderful. And of course, you can follow WHUR at WHUR FM and myself, Candace Atkins Wilson, on all of the social media sites. We'll take it to you, Gabriel. Thank you. Thank you so much. So even though the session's coming to an end, that doesn't mean the work comes to an end. So July does mean a lot to many of us. Um, as you all heard from Dr. Linda Wharton Boyd, we are here at the APA. We know the importance of making sure that we remember the legacy and do the work of B.B. Moore Campbell. So we're working hard every month of July, and we work hard every day, to be honest, to make sure that her work continues through our actions, because with great responsibility, I'm not trying to quote um, Superman or Spider-Man, whichever one it is, <laughs> but, you, know, you all have an amazing platform. And just looking around the room, there's a lot of people with amazing platforms. So I appreciate you being here to lend your time and most of all, go forth and actually use your voice. But if Dr. Levin's okay with it, if I can call him up and he and Dr. James can present two plaques to our pa to Candace and to our Grand Marshal. Wow. <laughs> oh, no. Mama, I made it. Mama, I made it. <laughs> oh, wow. Mama, I made it. Candace. This is so cool. Yeah. Then, so, Candace, you're here. Thank you. <laughs> Look, Dr. B. <laughs> and in the APA colors, it says the American Psychiatric Association. More equity and mental health initiative with our greatest appreciation presented to Candace Atkins Wilson for the commitment to achieving mental health equity July 27, 2023. Thank you so much. Wow. Thank you. And then for Dr. Levin, um, he says, because he does not have a microphone on his, but. <laughs> Trust me, no one's ever told me my voice is soft. <laughs> <laughs> My parents would say, please speak soft. <laughs> so uh, we want to present the American Psychiatric Association More Equity Mental Health Initiative with our greatest appreciation presented to Jay Barnett for his, or should say, for his service as our 2023 <laughs> APA More Equity and Mental Health Grand Marshal, wow. July 27th, 23. Wow, and in thank listening you, to the sister, your talk, uh, to, to both of you as the, as the chair as well, and obviously Regina's great. Thank you for doing this. Yo. Yes. The more we get out, the more we, the community begins to see yo, that people within your community has some form of depression, anxiety, who doesn't in this world coming out of COVID. And you standing up to talk, particularly because of your career, in such a great career. Yo, um, unfortunately, I'm not a great speaker. <laughs> 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 Okay. So thank you all, and I'll just say some parting words in addition to that. Thank you to nearly 500 people, not just locally, but from across the, the country, that are currently registered for our 5K. So we're hosting our third annual uh, More Equity in Mental Health 5K. It's this Saturday at Wheaton Regional Park at 7 a.m., but people can participate from anywhere that they find themselves that day. 
Back there with his camera, we actually do have the president of the APA Black Caucus, and they are currently close to fundraising $6,000 for this great event. The money raised from the 5K goes into a community grants program, so if you're a nonprofit that's listening to this, in September the application will open. It's a small grant to help you do an initiative that helps support young people of color focus on mental health anywhere in the nation. So thank you for being here today, and we appreciate you, and let's continue the dialogue. And our guests will be here, so you can chit-chat with them afterwards, too. So have a great day. Thank you. Mm -hmm.